Ah, good afternoon. My name is Kirsten Glendinning, and for the past eight years I have worked at Swillington Organic Farm, a mixed livestock farm on the urban fringes of Leeds. I started off growing vegetables for our box scheme, then in 2006 I bought a small herd of dairy goats. I converted a stable into a dairy and started making cheese for sale through the farm shop and at farmer's markets. It took me three years to realise what a nightmare goats are, and in 2010 I sold them and bought into the farm's um, flock of sheep which made life an awful lot easier. This farm on the urban fringe seemed to have everything going for it. It's 160 acres of fantastic soils with a huge market on the doorstep and run by people with passion and energy. But it has always struggled. I wanted to know why this was and what we could do about it and whether anyone else out there was interested in seeing the edges of our towns and cities playing a greater role in feeding us in the future. Hmm. <laughs> Perhaps we could have the light up for this bit. <laughs> Across the whole room would be good. Um, the first question I had to answer was, what exactly is the urban fringe and who are urban fringe farmers? Could I ask you to put your hand up if you farm within five miles of an urban centre of 10,000 people or more? So that's five miles out of 10,000 people. Okay, keep your hands up. And then put up your hand if you farm within 15 miles of an urban centre of 10,000 or more. Keep your hands up. And now put up your hands if you farm within 30 miles of an urban centre of 10,000 or more. That's probably about 70%. That's not quite representative of the UK. But 30 miles from a population of 10,000 or more is one key definition of urban fringe. And according to that, Britain actually has very little rural area at all. And that's 30 miles out from our farm in Leeds. But it quickly became apparent that I wasn't going to find a definition which would apply to all the countries I was going to. But I knew what I was looking for. I was looking for farmers who were making the most out of their location on the edge of cities and were thriving because of it rather than despite it. I travelled to New Zealand, Brazil, Sydney, China and Taiwan and nowhere had it right, nowhere had it perfect, but I saw char characteristics in each of them which together could help us transform the urban fringe here in the UK. I saw that an urban fringe, a farmed urban fringe benefits the entire agricultural industry. Food production on the edges of towns and cities raised the public awareness, public's understanding and awareness of agricultural issues, leading them to change their buying habits in favour of homegrown. Farming on the urban fringe brings new farmers into the industry, and most importantly for me, farming on the urban fringe can reduce the industry's overall CO2 emissions through reduced use of refrigerated transport. Now, I think we all agree we need new farmers in the industry. And in Taiwan, I met this group of, of new farmers in their early 30s. They were artists and had left the city to return to their grandparents' homes, uh, grandparents' farms um, around the city of Taipei. They had learnt to farm from their grandparents and were using their marketing skills and contacts in the city to turn the sweet potato, which is known as peasant's food in Taiwan, into a premium product, spearheading a campaign to reinvent the tag made in Taiwan as a guarantee for top quality homegrown foods. Like all farming businesses, farms on the urban fringe have to be creative and innovative to survive, and engaging people from the city who can bring a wealth of skills and experience into the farming industry is essential. The better the general public understands our industry, the better off we all are. As consumers gain an understanding of the cultural world, buying habits shift and their demands change. Of course, there's still a long way to go, but having thriving farming businesses close to urban centres would greatly support this process. In Western Sydney, I met three founders of the Hawkesbury Harvest, an organisation aimed at promoting the economic sustainability of agriculture in the Hawkesbury region. As well as email bulletins, farmers markets and event information, they have devised a series of farm gate trails, taking in farms, orchards, local scenic spots and restaurants. I saw this in New Zealand too, but as far as I'm aware, we don't have anything like this in the UK yet. A cycle tour guide around our towns and cities would be so easy to compile and could make a real difference to farming businesses on the edge of cities. The issue of urban fringe production has been on the agenda in the Sydney Basin for at least 20 years. The city is hemmed in by the Blue Mountains, the sea and poor soils. Hmm. Missing slide. Um, the soils in the basin, however, are some of the best in the country and are producing 90% of the perishable crops consumed in Sydney. They're producing 100% of the Asian crops consumed in the city, 80% of mushrooms and 90% of ducks consumed in Sydney. I met this group of farmers uh, who were working together to supply Asian vegetables grown in the western suburbs. These farms were rural when Hock Min and the others arrived in the 70s and 80s, but they now find themselves surrounded by luxury lifestyle blocks. The land prices have risen astronomically and they are, una are unable to expand. 
They have clubbed together and organised themselves so that they can fulfil contracts they would not otherwise have been able to deliver on. Hock Min, Mr Tang and Fred Haskins here, grow a limited range of Asian vegetables and deliver to the warehouse five nights a week. Their journey to delivery takes just 30 minutes, ensuring they are supplying the best product to a market that values fresh freshness above all else. For me, one of the most important changes a productive urban fringe could make is to reduce our reliance on refrigerated transport. Food with less embedded CO2 would make a significant contribution to reducing the, overall, the industry's overall emissions, a major challenge we will be facing. A farmed urban fringe could reduce the environmental impact of agriculture, could help educate our consumers and increase sales of home homegrown food, and could encourage more new farmers into the industry. But to do so, changes need to be made. We will need policies to protect land for agriculture, mechanisms to ensure land which could be producing food efficiently does so. We will have to intensify production on the urban fringe, and we'll have to be better at adapting to the market. And we will need a set of public procurement policies which recognise the importance of farming on the urban fringe and support it. And finally, we'll need politically active farmers to make this happen. As things stand, agriculture will always lose out to housing development when it comes to land sales at the edge of cities. The Empty Homes campaign estimates there are almost a million vacant homes across the UK, more than enough to house those in need. We don't need more houses, clearly. What we need to do is protect good agricultural land from development, because as we know, once it's gone, it's gone. The Chinese government is naturally concerned at keeping its population fed, and to try and ensure food security in the long term, they have set a minimum area of land which must always be under production at 120 million hectares, which is about 12.5% of the overall area of China. If a developer wants to build on land at the edge of the city, they must not only buy the right to build from the peasant who owns that right, they must also bring an area into production elsewhere in the country. At the moment, that area is usually the edge of the Gobi Desert or the foothills of the Himalayas. Though this system has some clear problems, it is an interesting approach to protecting land for farming. In Sydney, I was introduced to the idea of transferable development rights. This allows farmers to sell the right to develop their piece of land, similar to the carbon trading system. The capital, ra the capital raised allows the farmer to develop their business or to retire and sell on the land at a more viable rate. In order that the land retains its development value, the right to develop is renewed after 25 years. This aims to avoid the problem which is emerging in Sydney of what they call green deserts, farms which are sitting there not producing food, waiting to sell at a, 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 a value that will allow the owner to retire. So as well as mechanisms for protecting agricultural land from development, I want to see measures which discourage land from being left unused to prevent land grabbing and speculative holding until the economy suits development. New South Wales has a land taxation system which specifically refers to urban fringe land uh, used for food production and specifically does not include horses. I think this is a similar measure ne is needed here to make available all the land sitting fallow on our urban fringe. Intensified production was a common theme across the countries I visited. Around Sydney I met a number of growers using hydroponic systems to produce salads and Asian vegetables for the two major supermarkets. And in Beijing we saw polytunnel after polytunnel producing uh, veg through the winter. But the most persuasive uh, example of intensified production was at Mr Huang's egg farm, 10 minutes out of the business district of Taipei City. On less than an acre, he had built up a business supporting himself, his two sons and their families. He raises hens in sheds he designed himself for optimum airflow uh, with uh, deep bed litter inoculated with effective microorganisms. He claimed to experience very low levels of respiratory problems and absolutely no smell, which would have been important given how close his neighbours were. As I was about to leave, he gave me this advice. He said, if you have 10 acres, use one. Be the best you can be on that one acre. And when you've done that, move on to the second acre. I saw at Mr Huang's what I saw everywhere, and what we already know is a key to success, the ability to adapt to the market. In Beijing, the emerging market was the middle class's desire for strawberries in February. Polytunnel after polytunnel is full of strawberries, which are hand-picked and packaged for sale in the city's new and booming farmers' markets. So we need farms on the urban fringe, we need farmers on the urban fringe, but critically we also need public policies to support farming on the urban fringe. I saw in Brazil an approach to public procurement which had slashed childhood malnutrition, which was the intended outcome, and had doubled the incomes of farmers around the city, which was an added bonus. The Zero Hunger program was piloted in Belo Horizonte, a city of 2.3 million people, about six hours north of Rio, and this June it was adopted by the UN as a global initiative. 
Um, unfortunately, I've only got time to go into two elements of this programme, but if you're interested, I thoroughly recommend you go and look into it further. So when migrant farmers, like Joao here, um, arrived in the city in the 70s looking for work, the city government allocated them land on the edge of the city to produce food. They were to supp supply a proportion of their crops to the town schools and government offices. All the farmers I spoke to had doubled their incomes, thanks to the access they now had to the more lucrative urban market. And a number had even put their children through university, which is a real mark of success in rural Brazil. This approach to job creation has been so successful that in this town, all new housing developments must include land set aside for agriculture, like this two kilometre strip here at the edge of Sete Lagoas. The most interesting element of this programme, I thought, though, was a partnership programme between the municipal authority and the private sector to run greengrocers in poor parts of the city. The city provides a shop premises, and the greengrocer runs the shop with prices fixed at affordable rates. None of the customers I, spoke, none of the customers I spoke to knew they were buying state-subsidised food, and the brand has become so popular it was being used illegally by private enterprises. So as well as public procurement, we need enlightened policies to deal with urban waste. And this is uh, Jeff McSpedden, who farms over the Blue Mountains in New South Wales at Bathurst. Um, he was taking part in a trial using processed human waste from Sydney's largest sewage works. After 30 days processing, the muck was applied to his fields at a rate of 50 tonnes per acre. And at $2 an acre, uh, ton, uh, Jeff was pretty happy with the results. I'd like to see a legislation also uh, to allow us to do what Barbie's doing here, collecting fruit and vegetable waste from major supermarkets to feed her free-range pigs. We can't afford to be wasting the nutrients that are produced by the city, and it doesn't make sense to pay to process that waste and then not use it. And finally, we need to be making more noise on the fringe, politically speaking. And no one made this clearer than Steve Jones on the Hawkesbury River. After the oyster industry collapsed in 2006, he got together with 13 other oyster producers to form the Broken Bay Oyster Company aiming to rebuild the industry. They invested in new infrastructure, actively engaged with their local and upriver communities, joined local government committees, and developed strong relationships with their local officials. They have turned their industry around from being seen as the cause of the river's pollution problems to a symbol of the river's good health. They have made sure they are involved in discussions related to all aspects of the river's management. And through being active locally and politically, they have ensured policies which support their business rather than restrict it. So I propose a farm belt around our cities to overlap with our existing green belts, to bring together the characteristics I saw in the countries I visited. Farmers would work together to access markets and have greater ownership over the route to market. Farmers in the farm belt would produce top quality, high value crops in intensive systems which maintain the health of the environment so that farmers can also make most use of the tourism potential from the city. And farm belt producers would engage in local, <coughs> excuse me, and regional political decision-making to become a cohesive force linking the farming and non-farming worlds. Farm belt areas would have agriculture written into the local development plans in recognition of the economic, environmental and social contribution that agriculture can make to the areas. And farm belts would be covered by policies which support urban fringe farm businesses and protect the best soils for food production. Oh, that was a crop, that was supposed to be earlier. There you go. So basically, Nuffield has changed everything from me, um, everything for me. It gave me the confidence to um, leave the farm. I left the farm back in June, sold my sheep, and have moved to Manchester to work for this organisation, the Kindling Trust, um, trying to put into practice what I've learned through my Nuffield study. We run a land army which takes groups of people out to work on farms around Greater Manchester. We also set up and run Manchester Veg People, which is a co-op of producers and consumers buyers, which include Manchester University restaurants and caterers. We are setting up incubator farms around the city and greenhouses, where land army volunteers can then start renting small areas of land to produce commercially for Manchester veg people moving up as they graduate through the years. My Nuffield study has given me a wealth of material and ideas to draw upon, and the confidence to know that it can work. Nuffield has shown me a world of opportunity, and I hope I am able to put as much of it to use as possible. I'd like to thank all the people I met on my travels for their generosity and time, and my friends and family for putting up with me. Most especially, my sincerest thanks go to my sponsors, the John Oldacre Foundation and the, Farm and the Nuffield Farming Scholarships Trust, and of course, John Stones. Where are you? Uh, John Stones, for all his support over the past 15 months, and thank you for listening to me today. Thank you.